Okay, here we go. Well, a few things to, to look at. Um, I'll, I'll just show off my new website again that I've done there because uh, uh, it, is, it is pretty good, actually. And, and one of the things that Brian said about it is that um, um, we've bought a bit more space than we ever used to have with the old one because um, it's the same amount of money now. Um, and actually, that's how it was when I started. And there's a few more bits and pieces on there. There's quite a lot of photographs going on there, historical photographs of the uh, things that we've done and stuff. So um, HTTPS, the S is important, irishastro.org, um, and it's really good. But that's not what I'm really going to talk to you about tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, some things happening um, in the sky. Now, where there's nothing much happening, but a little bit more than there was, um, is that there have been a couple of sunspots, small ones, nothing exciting. Um, we are very much in solar minimum, um, and we've probably started solar cycle 25 by now. Uh, it, this is the problem with having small data samples in this, that so far this year, there have been 19 days with sunspots. Um, sorry, with, sorry, without sunspots, um, which is only 53%, which is actually less than there were in the whole of last year. So small data samples so far, we're only just over a month in. Um, but actually, it looks as if we could be on the way out. We could be, you know, sort of slightly where we were in 2009 rather than um, 2007 or 8. Um, so... Uh, we might be starting off a new site shortly. Uh, so that's, that's the sun. There's nothing much happening there. But uh, I'll just show you this again. This is, this is the projection for Solar Cycle 25 based on uh, it's, it's a lot of guesswork goes into this, as you can see. But 23 was a bigger cycle than 24 that we've just been through. 25, they're sort of saying, will be similar. Um, there, there is a theory going around. If you cast your mind back a few years to when um, the late Dr. Ian Elliott came up to talk to us from Dublin. Um, he was of the view that it was possible, no one knows, but it was possible that, we, that this downward trend could continue into a new Maunder minimum type situation, um, which would have fairly profound effects on our weather. Um, doesn't get us out of climate change, unfortunately, but uh, um, it would mean colder winters for, for northwestern Europe. Um, but 25, they're sort of saying, is, is not going to be part of that trend um, based on, on, again, theory, guesswork, whatever. Um, they're saying it would be about the same as 24. So that's, we don't know. We'll have to wait and see. It's one of the great unknowns. You, can, you don't actually know what's really going to happen until it happens. Um, and I think we probably, they did say the minimum would be give or take six months from April 2020. Well, just the way the sunspots are going at the minute, you might say that it would be six months earlier rather than six months later, possibly. But it all depends on what happens. So we'll keep an eye on all that. Now then, Shawnee Morris wins the Gold Cup for this. He has, he has photographed Mercury um, yesterday evening. That's, uh, that's from Tullamore direction. It's where Shawnee's based. Uh, and uh, he's got Mercury down there. Venus is, uh, oh, it's even way above there. He's, this, is, this is cropped in a bit, this. Um, but he's just found Mercury below the horizon, and actually it's, um, uh, it's a good time to see Mercury because it is now just appearing above the horizon. You've got about um, a sort of another 12 or 13 days probably to see it. Um, it will be initially bright and low, um, going a little bit higher, fading as it does so. It's actually coming towards the Earth at this point, um, which means that its phase will change. We'll show you that in a minute. Uh, its phase will change from being some, somewhat um, gibbous at the moment to a thinner crescent. Um, here's, uh, here's a, a, see, this is to see if the video plays time. Oh, yes, it, it looks like it might do. Here we go. Um, right, so here's where we are now. This is the 8th, 9th, 10th, and Mercury's coming up. But see how it's getting fainter as it, and it's going to be lost again into the twilight around about the 17th, 18th. Um, Venus rising as well, much higher up. Um, looking very good. And this is taken at about 10 to 6, this simulation. So something like that. Um, you should be able to see Mercury. Bear in mind um, that you know, it will put you into a, a good minority because we reckon somewhere around about 1% of the world's population ever seen Mercury. Even though it's often brighter than Sirius, um, it's always close to the sun, um, either in the morning or in the evening. So you're always looking at it in twilight, so it is quite hard to see. You've got to sort of search around with a pair of binoculars, ideally, is the, is the best way to see it. Um, you can see it naked eye. But, uh, um, 
they are, it is, it says, it's brighter than any star. Now, this is the phase of Mercury, and this is how it looks at the minute. Again, it's a sort of a stepping through on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, as it moves higher up, then it starts moving back into the, into the twilight again. It becomes a crescent around about the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th. and uh, You won't see it to the 20th, I don't think. It, you'd have to be very, very careful, apart from anything else, to, uh, to see it then. Um, that's Mercury. Um, Venus is also showing something of a phase at the minute. It is um, definitely somewhat gibbous, um, not quite half yet, and that will continue until it becomes a thin crescent right at the beginning of June. Again, you're going to lose it sometimes around the end of May, um, but this is just up to the end of March. This is, this is the Venus phase, um, and uh, here we go. We'll block through that. That will get smaller. Um, as it becomes a crescent, it becomes bigger. That is because it is closer to the Earth. It is moving all this time closer to the Earth, so the sun is more on the other side of it, um, but the actual diameter, apparent, gets bigger. Again, it's in, then it's into daylight. So that's um, the, the, the two inner planets putting on a pretty good show for us. Um, well worth having a look at those. Both just after sunset in the evening. Mercury's only just after sunset. Don't... Just a bit of advice, just don't go looking for it at all while the sun is still in the sky. It's not a good idea. Um, Venus you can see in daylight at times, um, but again, I would just advise, if you're going to do that, you'll need a telescope um, to do it, and you'll need to know where to point the telescope, because it's not at all obvious. Um, but um, try and put a house between you and the sun, if you're doing that, um, just so that uh, you're in shadow. Um, there's some morning planets for the early birds. Um, this, I've put this a couple of weeks' time because they're, they're really just coming out at the minute. Um, but uh, looking at two weeks' time, 19th of February there, 7 o'clock in the morning, there'll be a nice line-up in the southeast of Saturn, Jupiter, a moon that particular day, and then Mars further up. Um, all those planets that have been behind the sun for the last couple of months are coming out now. So, uh, good, good planets to see in the morning. Now then, here's a, a star you don't often see. HIP 14439. Um, and what's special about that is nothing much. It is just about naked eye visible. It's a fifth magnitude star. Um, what is special about it is that on the 11th of February in the evening, um, it will be occulted by asteroid Vesta. Uh, asteroid 4 Vesta will pass in front of it. It's of, of quite good scientific um, experience for experts because by precisely timing it, they get a measurement of the diameter of Vesta. Um, here's a bit of a, a look at the, the four largest asteroids. The, the asteroids are numbered in the order in which they were discovered. So Ceres is one, but Vesta is four, despite being the second biggest. And it is about 525 kilometers in diameter, much less regular than Ceres. Ceres is an asteroid, but these days is referred to as a dwarf planet. Um, they sort of put it in the same family as Pluto. Um, but Vesta is very much an asteroid, and uh, you can actually see it reasonably well in a, in a small telescope. Um, it's not quite naked eye. It's about, I think it's six point something or other, um, but uh, uh, just beyond naked eye visibility. But you can, you can pick it up and photograph the area quite easily and take a few over a time, and you'll see it move. Um, so this is the, um, where you need to be. It's slightly difficult to get, but this is, this is the shadow relative to that particular star um, cast by Vesta. So if you're in this area, across here, it will, it will be completely occulted. And, uh, and as you see, we're just about scraping to the right side of this. Um, so uh, most of us here would, would stand a chance of seeing that. So uh, that's it's the evening of 11, the 11th of February, uh, just on 10 o'clock. Um, so there we go, okay. Um, another star of great interest at the moment, Betelgeuse. If you've looked up at Betelgeuse, you'd have noticed that all is not well. If, um, I, I, for the opposite reason, I, mean, I, I usually like to see Betelgeuse, um, you know, in August, September sort of time, uh, just to look at it and see, well, you know, is that brighter than Rigel? Is that about to explode any time? Um, what's happened since October is it's got much dimmer. Um, and it is now an estimated magnitude 1.6, um, same as Bellatrix next to it, and nothing like Rigel 
um, down at the bottom corner of, uh, um, of Orion. And of course now, if you go back to you know, the, the Greek naming of the stars, um, Betelgeuse is Alpha Orionis, so maybe at one time it was even brighter than Rigel. Um, but uh, now it definitely isn't. It's, uh, it's, it's about one and a half magnitudes less than Rigel. It's normally 0.4, and it's normally the 11th brightest star in the sky. It is now the 24th brightest star in the sky. And, uh, and this is a graph that somebody has put together from, um, from visual data going back 35 years. Um, and they see it is a variable star. It has at least three cycles of, of variability. And maybe one possibility is they've just all come together at once and produced this massive dip here. But it is 125 years since it's been that low. And I think that's only because the records only go back that far. Um, so this, you know, it might be the, the, the dimmest it's ever been. Uh, but uh, various possibilities here. Um, a very remote one of which is it's contracting and about to explode. I mean, that nice as that would be to be, you know, the lucky generation that got to see that. It's going to happen sooner or later, but maybe not for a million years. Um, but someone's going to see it, aren't they? You know, um, let's be positive. Someone's going to win the lottery. And it's not going to be me. Um, I don't buy the tickets, that's why. But, um, but uh, other possibilities, one is that it's just gone into a cloud of dust, one that's thrown off um, just some material that's now obstructing the light from it. Um, it. It does seem to have got a little bit bigger, as much as they can measure these things. Let's say it normally goes out from the sun to the, the orbit of Jupiter, um, but it seems some measurements say that it's got a little bigger in this dimming thing. So, um, and actually, if it was about to explode, you'd expect it to contract. So. It's probably not lucky time, this, but uh, keep an eye on Betelgeuse. Uh, another theory that I saw, again, couldn't quite explain this one to you, but they say that there might be a rebound, um, in, which it c in which case it might come back brighter than Rigel, which wouldn't quite be um, magnitude minus 12, that the explosion would bring us, but it'll be worth seeing anyway. So that's Betelgeuse. Now, just one other thing, really, while you're up in that part of the sky, don't forget to have a good look round. Um, it's a very interesting part of the sky. You've got uh, Orion here, of course, Betelgeuse, Rigel. The belt, go down the belt to find Sirius, and uh, um, Canis Major is about as good as you get to see it in the evenings at the moment. Um, up the other way, of course, Aldebaran. You've got the head of the bull there and the seven sisters. Um, further up there, you can always play the game of, uh, of counting the seven sisters. I only ever see six. Um, just as an interesting aside, actually, this part of the sky... Um, gets a lot more interesting if you look at it from a further south latitude. Um, because you've got Sirius here. If you go another sort of 20 or 30 degrees down here, somewhere, is Canopus, the second brightest star in the sky. It's really quite close to, um, to Sirius, um, except that you don't see it ever from here. But uh, I have seen Canopus from Florida, from central Florida, where it sits just above the horizon at a certain time. Um, and the other one is, of course, you've got the constellation um, Eridanus here, the river, just starting here from next to Rigel, goes, so it goes a long, long way down there. And also sort of further down there is, is Alpha Eridani, which is Achenar, um, also a very bright southern hemisphere sky. And uh, um, the convention is that you take those two stars, Canopus and Achenar, and you make an equilateral triangle, and the, the, the bit of the point that we way down here is roughly where the South Pole is. Um, they do not have a nice Polaris there. They've got a thing called Sigma Octantis that no one can ever see. Um, which is, and, and, and it's not close to the South Pole, but apart from that, it's great. You know, but, uh, um, um, but they do have a much better Milky Way than we do. So that's all I've got to say on the stars. Enjoy. Get out and uh, have some fun. All right. Thanks.